Hi, I'm Eric Voss, and Avengers Infinity War was quite a movie, and one of the things that made it so enjoyable to watch was the way it rewarded all of us hardcore nerds for paying attention throughout this MC university. It is packed with subtle little callbacks and nods to past Marvel movies and comics, but also with deeper layers of hidden meaning that make its shocking conclusion such a gut punch. But like, a gut punch we need builds character. So let's re-watch Infinity War and point out all the interesting details that you might have missed. Spoilers ahead if you haven't seen it yet. And let us start with the opening image. Over black, we hear a distress call from the Asgardian ship as Thanos attacks. This is the same distress call later responded to by the Guardians of the Galaxy. And maybe this Asgardian voice sounded similar to you. This is a vocal cameo by actor-director Kenneth Branagh. He directed the first Thor movie. Then we move on board this ransacked ship with Ebony Maw stepping over dead Asgardians. Creepy. Ebony Maw is a member of Thanos' Black Order a squad of lieutenants who serve him. It first appeared in recent years in the New Avengers comics, consisting of Corvus Glaive, Proxima Midnight, Ebony Maw, and Black Dwarf, who was renamed Cull Obsidian in this movie. Cull Obsidian was the name of the whole group in the comics. There was also a member named Supergiant who was left out of this movie. I made a whole other video explaining the Black Order that you can go check out. Thanos' opening monologue lays out his whole vision, that he knows what it feels like to lose. He introduces the core theme of Infinity War, sacrifice, the bitter cost that must be paid for victory. Thanos is suggesting that as someone who has made more sacrifices than most, that makes him better fit to survive and more deserving of his goals. And as the character of this movie who most aggressively goes after what he wants, this moment establishes Thanos as the protagonist of Infinity War. Really, as you're re-watching it, you should look at Thanos as the hero of this movie. Is that historical revisionism? Maybe. Shut up. Loki surprises Thanos by telling him, we have a Hulk. This is a callback to Tony Stark's face-to-face -to -face with Loki in the first Avengers. I have an army. We have a Hulk. Loki borrowing Stark's line here shows us how far the previous villain has come. He's still the god of mischief, but now there's a genuine affection for his brother and his friends. Notice how when he introduces himself as Odinson, he gives Thor a look of sadness. For me, this echoes Odin's death in Thor Ragnarok. My sons, I've been waiting for you. Odin finally greeting Loki as his own blood there was a huge deal for the Black Sheep. And by calling himself Odinson here, he's calling Thor a true brother. Loki's death is a real crushing way to open the film. It lets us know that the previous favorite villain of the MCU has been usurped. Notice how Thanos tells Thor, no resurrections this time. This is a callback to Loki's history of faking his own death, like at the end of Thor The Dark World. Come to think, that hoax might have been how Loki was able to avoid Thanos' wrath after failing him in the Avengers. After after his charade was revealed in Ragnarok, Loki's days were pretty much numbered. This scene also features the death of Heimdall, who makes another callback when he prays to the Allfathers to give him the dark energy to activate the Bifrost to teleport Hulk to safety. Loki actually mentioned the Allfathers to Thor in the first Avengers. With the Bifrost gone, how much dark energy did the Allfather have to muster to conjure you here? After Thanos escapes with the Space Stone, Hulk crashes back to New York, forming a crater in the Sanctum Santorum. This is a reference to the Marvel comics when the Silver Surfer crashed landed in the sanctum, warning them about Thanos. Meanwhile, over in the park, Tony Stark tells Pepper Potts about dreaming of having a kid named Morgan. In the comics, Morgan Stark is actually the name of Tony's cousin. It's interesting that Tony's so hung up on that sensation of waking up from a dream and momentarily feeling like it's real. His confusing dreams with reality could be foreshadowing the film's conclusion. Remember, in Age of Ultron, Tony envisioned a nightmare showing all of his fellow Avengers dead, or maybe just sleepy. Now, I know, the main OG Avengers happen to make it out of this movie fine. But overall, Tony's catastrophic nightmare scenario does become a reality by the time the credits roll. Back in the sanctum, Tony butts heads with Doctor Strange, leaning against the cauldron of the cosmos. That cauldron is from the Doctor Strange comics. Strange uses it to help Spider-Man look backwards in time. They also joke about Ben and Jerry's naming ice cream flavors after them, Stark raving hazelnuts and a hunk of hulk of burning fudge. That's a riff on the Elvis song, a hunk of hunk of burning love. Tony mocks Strange, asking, what is your job exactly besides making balloon animals? This could be a reference to a bit Benedict Cumberbatch did as Doctor Strange with Jimmy Kimmel. But Strange's response is interesting. Protecting your reality, douchebag. Strange is reminding us that there are multiple realities, a vast multiverse that he has explored. This could be setting up one possible solution to ultimately defeating Thanos. Maybe bringing the fight into another reality where the rules of time and space operate differently. Tony admits that he lost track of Vision, and Bruce scolds him for losing 
in another superbot. He's referring to Ultron, the superbot whose tech led to Vision's creation. A process that, no matter how many times I rewatch Age of Ultron, I don't think I will ever fully understand. Then Tony pulls out this flip phone to call Steve Rogers. This is a callback to Captain America Civil War, which ended with Cap FedExing Tony Stank a letter and this old man flip phone to stay in touch. Next, we get our first shot of Peter Parker in this movie with this close up of the hairs on his arm shooting up. This is the first instance in the MCU of Spidey Sense. Apparently, Spider Man did have it in Homecoming, we just never saw him use it. It's interesting that the Russos depict it this way. Traditionally, Spider Man's Spidey Sense comes from a real life spider's actual ability to sense vibrations through tiny hairs that cover their bodies. So, Peter's hair sticking up here is actually grounded in science, making it the only thing in this movie to have any real scientific basis. We get our traditional cameo from Stan Lee as the school bus driver. And then Peter's t-shirt here has another goofy caption, like all the ones he wore in Homecoming. Lettuce, the taste of sadness. That's a little depressing to rewatch this movie and know that by the end, Peter will teach us a whole new taste of sadness. Hello. The heroes team up to deal with the chaos caused by the Black Order's Q ship, and Doctor Strange uses this spell to reduce the gusty winds. This spell is probably the Winds of Watoom, which is a move he uses in the comics. Tony calls Ebony Maw Squidward, and Bruce struggles to summon the big guy, leading to this Jekyll and Hyde face, half Bruce, half Hulk, which is inspired by art we've seen in the comics before. After returning to Earth, Hulk is a real no-show in Infinity War. We did see him running in that big splashy marathon shot in the trailer, which I suspected would not be in the final movie. It definitely wasn't. But the reason for Hulk's performance anxiety is that in the opening scene, Hulk straight up lost in a fight for the first time ever. Now, in past movies, he definitely took beatings, but Thanos knocked him out cold. Now, that's gotta be quite an existential shock to Hulk. So he's either afraid or just too proud. He doesn't wanna get knocked out again. In this sequence, we also get a look at Iron Man's new nanotech armor called Bleeding Edge. In the comics, Stark's Bleeding Edge armor comes out of nanobots in his blood, assembling out of his skin. Here, it looks more similar to Black Panther's vibranium armor. It stems out of a central node and then pieces together around his body. During the fight, Ebony Maw tries to snatch Doctor Strange's Eye of Agamotto, but a protective spell burns his hand. This could be a nod to Raiders of the Lost Ark when that Nazi guy, Tote, tries to steal the Staff of Ra headpiece and it burns his hand, leaving a scar. Ma and Tote are definitely pretty parallel. They speak in chilling, high-pitched voices, they seem to love torturing people, and they have epic deaths. And then after Peter Parker gets his new Iron Spider armor, so cool, Stark activates his parachute saying, happy trails. He's quoting Die Hard when Bruce Willis pulls one of the best behind the back switcheroos in movie history. Happy trails, Hans. Okay, moving on to the Guardians of the Galaxy. The song they're listening to is Rubber Band Man by the Detroit Spinners. This track is actually from Yondu Zune, which Peter Quill picked up at the end of volume two. Teenage Groot is playing a handheld video game, Defender. This was an arcade game, also an Atari 2600 game. This could be a nod to the Defenders, one of the few Marvel screen adaptations not otherwise to make it into this movie. A lot of the game also involves defending Earth from aliens, so it's a pretty appropriate choice. The Guardians run into Thor, leading to some pretty amazing comedy between the Chris's. I should point out that Thor reports that Thanos slaughtered half of his Asgardian survivors. Now to me, it looked like all of them were dead. But if we take Thor at his word, Valkyrie, Korg, and Meek, who were all on that ship at the end of Ragnarok, might have been among those survivors. Thor, Rocket, and Groot split off to Nidavellir, which is a place from the Marvel comics. It's one of the Asgardian nine worlds, along with Asgard. It's where their weaponry comes from. It's cool that we actually get to see this place in the movie. Until now, Thor has mentioned that his hammer, Mjolnir, was forged in the heart of a dying star, but Infinity War confirms that he meant a literal dying star, and we get to see that star in action. If you were a blacksmith, you probably really dug this plotline. If you didn't, it's always fun to hear Thor call Rocket Rabbit. Definitely one of my favorite running jokes in these movies. That's how eyesight works, you stupid raccoon. Don't call me a raccoon! I'm sorry. I took it too far. I meant trash panda. Jumping over to Vision and Scarlet Witch in Scotland, when they look through a restaurant window, notice a sign. We will deep fry your kebab. That's a joke about Scotland's tendency to deep fry all of their food. Mmm, sounds like a magical place. Then when Corvus Glaive and Proxima Midnight attack, the fight spills over to this metro station where Captain America makes his awesome entrance with the opening beat of the Avengers theme music. Notice how his look has changed in the two years since Civil War. It's darker, he's got a beard, and his suit no longer has the classic white star emblem. Cap's 
whole look here is modeled on the nomad run of the character in the Marvel comics, when Cap becomes a soldier without a country. But if you look really closely at his suit, a tear shows that he's still wearing that older scale armor underneath. So even though the guy looks different, he hasn't completely changed his identity. This fight ends with Black Widow's cold promise. We don't want to kill you. Oh, we will. And Proximo responds, you'll never get the chance again. I love how this sets up their confrontation later when Proxima nearly kills Natasha, but then Scarlet Witch lifts her to get wiped out by one of those big tank things. Then after Gamora's flashback showing her becoming a child of Thanos, we arrive at nowhere. Among the collector's collection is this blue man on the left. This is a reference to the show Arrested Development, which the directors, the Russo brothers, used to work on. They've actually done this before, putting a Bluth family stair truck in the background of the airport battle in Civil War. This is a nod to the Tobias gag where he was trying to join the Blue Man group and then he stalked his wife by blending in with blue backgrounds. I love that they include the detail of his never nude jean cutoffs. There's another really fun reference when Thanos interrogates the Collector, played by Benicio Del Toro. Notice how Thanos asks for the Reality Stone. Where's the stone? Thanos is doing an impression of Del Toro's character in the movie Snatch, Frankie Fourfingers, who was a jewel thief. There is the stone. Maybe the reason Thanos Thanos knows this is because he actually already has the Reality Stone. He can look into other realities. Notice how he uses the Reality Stone to turn Drax into blocks and Mantis into ribbons. This is a reference to Thanos in the comics when he uses the Reality Gem to do this to Nebula and Star Fox, aka Eros. And then after Star-Lord calls Thanos Grimace, he tries to make good on his promise to Gamora to kill her if she ever gets captured, but Thanos turns his blast into bubbles. This could be a nod to Thanos in the Marvel vs. Capcom games where one of his moves was to trap people in a bubble. Back at Avengers HQ, Black Widow explains why Hawkeye and Ant-Man are not in this movie. Clint is with his family, Scott is on house arrest. Vision proposes that Scarlet Witch destroy the Mind Stone in his forehead, arguing that one life shouldn't stand in the way of half the universe. But Cap refuses, saying, we don't trade lives. Again, Infinity War is touching back on that whole theme of sacrifice. What do you lose by winning? Is the cost worth it? And then when Cap suggests that he knows a place to hide Vision, you may recognize the music. The sound you're hearing is the tall talking drum used by composer Ludwig Göransson in the Black Panther score. So we move on to Wakanda, where T'Challa meets with Bucky, calling him the White Wolf. Now we heard kids calling him White Wolf in the post credit scene for Black Panther. In the Marvel comics, White Wolf is a separate character. He was a white kid adopted by T'Challa's father, who later became the character Hunter, who led the Covert Ops War Dogs group. It sounds like the movies could be merging the characters, or at least using White Wolf as a Wakanda nickname for Bucky. Meanwhile, back on Ebony Maw's Q ship, we see him torture Doctor Strange is another detail pulled from the Marvel comics. Ebony Maw actually breaks Strange in the comics, which is a huge defeat considering Strange is the most powerful mind in the Marvel world. Spider-Man pitches a plan to save Strange based on the movie Alien, calling it a really old movie. This is a callback to the way he took inspiration from the Empire Strikes Back to bring down Ant-Man in Civil War. Hey guys, you ever seen that really old movie? Uh, Empire Strikes Back? You know that part? Where they're on the snow planet? With the walking thingies! His plan here, it turns out, is exactly how Ripley defeats the Xenomorph at the end of Alien, as well as the Xenomorph Queen in Aliens, blow the sucker out into space. Ebony Maw even makes the same angry pose as he floats away that the Alien Queen did at the end of Aliens. Later, Peter screams at Mantis to not lay eggs inside him, referencing the Xenomorph facehuggers who incubate offspring inside the host, burst out their chest. During the fight with Ebony Maw, the Iron Spider suit releases these spider legs. These are from the Marvel Civil War comics. They're called Waldos. And I'm so glad that the movie left these out of the trailers and left them as a surprise. Peter shouts, what are those? Which is a callback to Shuri's line in Black Panther is what are those? Both are referencing the meme. Question fight. What are those? Back on Thanos' ship, he shows Gamora how he's torturing Nebula with this cool shot rotating around to show how she's been pulled out into pieces. Now Thanos tortures Nebula in the Infinity Gauntlet comics, but it's even more graphic there. He basically burns her and forces her to stay alive. Gamora is seeing Nebula's various machine parts all splayed out. Echoes Nebula explaining her cruel upbringing to Kraglin in Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 2. Every time my sister prevailed, my father would replace a piece of me with machinery. But she won. Again. And again, and again, never once refraining. 
So this image reminds Gamora of her guilt for doing this to her sister, and it motivates why she concedes to take Thanos to the Soul Stone. Meanwhile, with Thor's group, Rocket gives Thor this replacement eye. This is a callback to Rocket's weird interest in stolen body parts, specifically the Ravager eye that he stole in Guardians Volume 2. Now this eye isn't that same one, exactly. Rocket says that he found this one on Contraxia, which was the frozen planet that we saw in that movie. Then they arrive at Nidavellir, where they meet Peter Dinklage's character. He plays Itri, the king of the dwarves. They work as foragers and blacksmiths. He is their sole survivor. Itri reveals that Thanos forced him to build the Infinity Gauntlet and he blames Thor for not protecting him and his people. This actually answers a key question that has kept coming up. Why did Thanos only attack now? What has he been waiting for? Well, the answer is a way to contain all the Infinity Stones. He couldn't wield all of them together without this gauntlet. It was forged in the heat of the same dying star that produced Mjolnir. For ages, Nidavellir was protected by Asgard, but recent events changed that. Odin went missing, and Loki basically allowed the Nine Realms to fall into chaos. Then in Thor Ragnarok, Odin died, Hela returned, and that eventually resulted in the complete obliteration of Asgard. All of this left Nidavellir open to attack, allowing Thanos to get the one tool he needed to really move forward with his Infinity Plot. Now, this does kind of present a bit of a timeline hiccup because we did see Thanos put on that gauntlet in the post credit scene after Age of Ultron, but maybe we can assume that scene took place after Thanos sacked Nidavellir following the events of Ragnarok. The new hammer that Eitri forges for Thor is called Stormbreaker, which is another Marvel Comics reference. That's the name of the battle axe carried by Beta Ray Bill, who was a Corbinite version of Thor. Groot breaking off his arm branch to form the handle of Stormbreaker was such a badass moment, and it actually presents a question. Groot is, of course, among the ones who fade away at the end of this movie, but in the past, if even as much as a twig of him survives, a new Groot could theoretically form. So can a new Groot form out of the handle of Stormbreaker? Well, that would make for a really fun reveal for Thor. May the strength of the All Fathers I am Groot. Holy sh Meanwhile on Titan, the Guardians meet Tony's group and devise their own plan against Thanos. Drax suggests a dance-off to save the universe, which is a reference to Star-Lord's dance-off with Ronin at the end of the first Guardians. Spider-Man compares this to Footloose, Star-Lord's favorite movie, calling back Mantis bringing up Kevin Bacon as Earth's Mightiest Hero earlier in the movie. While they argue, Doctor Strange uses a time stone to look in the future at over 14 million different timelines, where the Avengers win in only one of them. Now, I have a lot of thoughts about what that timeline is and how all of Doctor Strange's actions from this point forward, like trading the Time Stone for Tony Stark's life, saying we are in the end game now, and his final words being this was the only way, all this could be a part of Doctor Strange's specific plan. But I'm actually making another video that digs into all of those theories, so stay tuned. Let's move on to Vormir, the resting place of the Soul Stone. Vormir is another location in the Marvel comics. It's home to a race of beings called Vorms. They're giant dragon lizard things that travel a galaxy looking for planets to feast on. But the biggest shocker on this planet was a cameo by Red Skull. Huh? Red Skull, of course, was the villain of the first Captain America movie, except he's not being played here by Hugo Weaving. This is actor Ross Marquand. He's a skilled impressionist and Aaron from The Walking Dead, where he does a wonderful impression of caring about his character's storylines. We last saw Red Skull trying to harness the Tesseract, but the power of the Space Stone sucked him into the cosmos. He explains to Thanos and Gamora that he wasn't deemed worthy to wield the Space Stone, so now he has to serve as a keeper of the Soul Stone. His hooded appearance might possibly be meant to evoke Mistress Death from the Infinity Gauntlet comics, the cosmic entity Thanos is in love with and does everything for. If you listen closely, Red Skull references Alars. Alars is an Eternal in the Marvel comics. It's the name of Thanos' father. This whole moment is perhaps the movie's most emotional example of that sacrifice theme that I mentioned before. This idea of a soul for a soul, having to give up someone you love, it's an archetypal story beat that we've seen over and over again in mythology. In the Bible, Abraham has has to sacrifice his son Isaac before a last minute, just kidding, from God. And in the Game of Thrones book series, The Legend of Azor Ahai required him to plunge his sword into the heart of his wife, Nissa Nissa, to forge Lightbringer. It's this moment that Thanos becomes more than a simple villain. It truly breaks his heart to kill Gamora. And afterward, he returns to Titan and talks with Doctor Strange about his motivations. Thanos uses the Reality Stone to show Strange Titan's utopian past before overpopulation destroyed its environment. Now, this is a major change from Thanos' backstory in the comics, which casted him as a young lone 
owner and pacifist who fell in love with a female embodiment of death that led him on a vengeful killing spree. Here, he's more of an eco-terrorist, protecting the universe from itself. It's honestly not too different from Ultron. Doctor Strange asks him what he'll do after wiping out half the universe, and he responds, finally rest and watch the sun rise on a grateful universe. Now, not to throw too many religious metaphors at you, but Thanos is casting himself as a god figure, despite Loki promising him that he would never be one. In Thanos' eyes, his story is not one of destruction, it's a creation story. In fact, the one from Genesis. The six infinity stones could reflect the six days it took God to build the universe, and Thanos resting to watch the sun rise could reflect that seventh day in which God rested. The fight that follows includes a few interesting visual references. Spider-Man webs Thanos in the face, which is a move he pulls in the comics. Doctor Strange also uses a few familiar spells. The Crimson Bands of Citarac, Red Lassos, a mystical energy from the comics. Looks like he tries to trap Thanos in the mirror dimension, which is something we saw the Ancient One do to Kaecilius in the Doctor Strange movie. Then Doctor Strange makes this interesting multi-armed pose that's also inspired by art from the Doctor Strange comics. It leads to Strange spitting off dozens of copies of himself, which looks like in the comics, which he replicates himself over and over again. Strange's pose also resembles the Hindu figure Durga the goddess of war. Durga translates to invincible, so maybe Doctor Strange is using this imagery to intimidate Thanos. But Thanos isn't fooled. He knows which Strange is the real one. This could be a benefit of having the reality stone or the soul stone. Some of you also asked about Thanos recognizing Stark and saying, you're not the only one cursed with knowledge. So maybe this means that acquiring the soul stone connected Thanos to all the souls of the universe, knowing where each of them are and everything about them. Or maybe Thanos just remembers the asshole who popped up into a wormhole from Earth and nuked his army. Mm. Also, you might have noticed how Nebula crashes a party in a necrocraft. This is the same kind of ship that we saw in the first Guardians of the Galaxy. Really, it was just awesome to see this team combine their strengths to restrain Thanos, nearly close enough to slip the gauntlet off his hand, that is, until Star-Lord ruined it by flipping out over Thanos killing Gamora, allowing Thanos to escape their grasp. Now, we actually went into whether everything was Star-Lord's fault in another video, but pre-watching the movie, you could place the blame for Thanos' victory on a lot of characters. Tony Tony insisted on taking a Q-ship to Titan to confront Thanos, even though Doctor Strange wanted to turn back and keep the Time Stone away from him. Thor used Stormbreaker to hit Thanos in his chest so that he could look him in the eyes as he avenged his Asgardian fallen, instead of just killing Thanos immediately with a headshot. And then yeah, Cap and Scarlet Witch, Banner, and the others insisted on finding a way to remove the Mind Stone from Vision without killing him, when Vision just wanted it done right away. This allowed Thanos to rewind time just a few seconds to retrieve it intact in the final moments. Basically you could play this what if game endlessly, but it'll be interesting to see if this survivor's guilt affects any of the others in the next movie. But let us talk about this final battle on Wakanda. It begins with this prophetic line from T'Challa to Proxima. Thanos will have nothing but dust and blood. Black Panther doesn't yet realize it, but that's exactly what ends up happening. He and several others end up turning into dust. And for blood, yeah, you could argue that it might refer to that one drop of blood that Stark gets out of his face on Titan. As they line up for battle, T'Challa and his troops chant Ibambe, which is a word in the South African language of Hosa, which Wakandan is based on, translating to hold fast or hold strong. The four-armed foot soldiers that they fight are called Outriders. They're pretty beastly and animalistic in this movie, but in the comics, they're genetically engineered assassins that can turn invisible and read people's minds while they sleep. In the opening charge against these guys, we see Cap and Black Panther sprinting out ahead of the front line. This echoes their super fast foot chase in Civil War, and it's just satisfying to see them running side by side this time, like their goals are aligned. Thor's entrance in this battle is truly epic. It's one of the moments that I think is really justified standing up and clapping as you're watching the movie. It definitely recalls his God of Thunder return in Ragnarok, but if you look closely, it appears that he uses the Bifrost to bring himself here. That's interesting. This could mean Stormbreaker possesses the power of the Bifrost. Frost. Remember, while he held open that forge, he did pray to the Allfathers to give him strength. So perhaps this whole new weapon allows him to teleport from place to place. Nifty. We get a few more great pairings. Bucky lifts Rocket to spin him around as he lights up the Outriders. This is a callback to Guardians when Rocket does this with Groot. Afterward, Rocket asks Bucky how much for the arm, chuckling and saying, oh, I'm gonna get that arm. This is another callback to Guardians when Rocket jokingly requested that he wanted that guy's prosthetic leg. But all their efforts are for naught because the Mad Titan arrives and he takes all of them out, one by one. Little design detail that I really liked here, when Thanos rewinds time to assemble the Mind Stone, he rotates his gauntlet counterclockwise. I guess that was the same direction in Doctor Strange, I just didn't really notice it till now. Then Thanos does exactly what we all feared. He 
snaps his fingers. He actually does it. Marvel Studios, you crazy bastards. This twist, of course, was pulled directly from the Infinity Gauntlet comics. Thanos actually goes through with it there too. And it's every bit as dramatic. Half the universe fades away. Here, watching it happen to these big screen faces we've gotten to know and love over the past decade. Man, oh man, does it hurt. Bucky, Wakandan soldiers, Black Panther, Groot, Scarlet Witch, Falcon. And then on Titan, Mantis, Drax, Peter Quill, Doctor Strange. And then the post credit scene, there's Nick Fury and Maria Hill. But the saddest one of all is Peter Parker. Uh, not to make you feel worse, guys, but notice how he says, Mr. Stark, I don't feel so well. Now, the rest of the characters are pretty much confused by what's going on, but Peter feels sick to his stomach. That's because his spidey sense is alerting him that the end is near. So rather than confusion, Peter's final moments are spent in fear and agony and panic. It's actually kind of poetic considering his opening frame showed his spidey sense, as do his closing moments. Hell guys, even the title of the movie fails fades away during the credits. Also, if you're curious about where Thanos went the moment he snapped his fingers, my best guess is Soul World. It's a plane associated with Soul Stone in the comics. Sam Basher and I have made other videos that kind of dig into that more. Actually, this moment reminded me a lot of the final Harry Potter movie, when Harry uses the Resurrection Stone and enters into a hazy, otherworldly realm where he meets with the spirit of Dumbledore before returning to the real world. Could have been a coincidence, but maybe the Soul Stone has a similar power. If Thanos happened to be in the half of the universe that got wiped out in that snap wave, Perhaps the Soul Stone is what resurrected him. The final image of the movie shows Thanos making good on that promise to Doctor Strange to rest and watch the sunrise. He no longer wears his armor or the Infinity Gauntlet. Actually, if you look closely in the corner, you can see his armor hanging up. That's a reference to the Infinity Gauntlet comics in which Thanos retires on a farm, hanging up his armor on a scarecrow. It's actually not clear if the gauntlet is there as well. It looked pretty fried and broken up after the snap. So hopefully that means he can't snap away another 25% of the universe. But as of now, now, the remaining survivors are Iron Man, Captain America, Thor, Banner, Black Widow, War Machine, Nebula, Rocket, Okoye, M'Baku, and Shuri and Wong, I think. I think Hawkeye, Ant-Man, and the Wasp were out there. And yeah, so is Captain Marvel, as we learned in the post credit scene. Go check out my breakdown video of that. Yes, this was super shocking to see the movie end with such a bleak cliffhanger. But if we're being honest with ourselves, this was a promise Marvel has been making since the beginning. Not just with the moment in the Infinity Gauntlet comics. The movies have gradually been warning us about this. There was Tony's line to Loki in the first Avengers. Because if we can't protect the Earth, you can be damn well sure we'll avenge it. Then in the second Avengers movie, Age of Ultron, we learn that these movies are actually willing to kill off an Avenger. And it left us with that haunting image of Tony's nightmare. It also gave us this warning. We'll lose. And we'll do that together too. And then the last two MCU movies to lead into this one made us grow up a little. Thor Ragnarok ended by following through on the promise of its premise by actually destroying Asgard while people watched helplessly. Shortly after that, Black Panther forced us to actually empathize with a villain to see the logic in an evil plan. Both movies helped prepare us for Thanos, a villain with an empathetic apocalyptic plan that we were just helpless to watch. But just as Thanos' sacrifice made him stronger, the losses of the Avengers will make them stronger too. Too, inspiring them to fulfill the promise of their identities to avenge. Now, you may still have a lot of questions about Infinity War, and we've already started to answer a lot of them that have come up in our heads with other videos, like what happens in this movie's ending and the post credit scene, how exactly does the Soul Stone work, and what are the ways that the Avengers could fight back in the next movie, where is Hawkeye? Go watch all those videos on those subjects. But we also got even more questions to dig into in the pipeline, like how much of this defeat was part of the timeline that Doctor Strange foresaw? and what exactly was his plan? And what exactly happened to the characters who appeared to die? Can they come back? And who else might have died that we didn't see? But a question I want to leave you with is, which of the surviving characters do you think will survive the final confrontation with Thanos in Avengers 4? Comment down below to let me know your thoughts. And thank you to our sponsor Skillshare for helping us make this video. Skillshare is an online learning community with thousands of classes in design, business, technology, and more. Its premium membership gives you unlimited access to high quality classes on must know topics so you can improve your skills, unlock new opportunities, and do the work you love. The work I love is writing, and the hardest part of writing for me is commitment to a routine. So I really love Simon Van Bowie's writer's toolkit, Six Steps to a Successful Writing Habit. His steps were really helpful in helping me be more productive. So if you do any creative work, I highly recommend it. Skillshare is also more affordable than most learning platforms out there. An annual subscription is less than $10 a month. But we're even gonna do a special offer for you guys. The first 500 people to sign up with the 
the link in the description below will get their first two months for free. Just go to skl.sh slash newrockstars3 or click on the link in the description. For all of you, you can tweet me directly at EA Voss or follow New Rockstars on Twitter for updates on our videos. Like and share this video. Subscribe to New Rockstars for all of our coverage on Avengers Infinity War. Thanks for watching, everybody. Bye.